and vis a the uh, Soviet Union, if the United States did not intervene in Korea, was there concern that Japan might go to the Soviet side? Uh, I mean, there was a lot of yeah. communist things. Okay, well, I'll answer that one. Yeah, there was. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, certainly uh, Truman felt that uh, the, the Soviet expansion had to stop somewhere. Um, some pointed out that, you know, that, that Korea had always been uh, a contested area. Uh, the Chinese and Japanese have, have both gotten nervous over several millennia over who controlled the, the Korean uh, peninsula. Um, so I, I think the Japanese would have been very nervous about our defense commitments to them if South Korea had fallen. And this might have led the Japanese to decide that their constitution really needed to be changed and they needed to provide for their own defense, which would have made the Chinese nervous and uh, created a, a very unstable situation. And so, and second one is, after the MacArthur landing, uh, the North Korean military was pretty much uh, neutralized, as far as I know. So how much of a factor did the North Korean uh, military have uh, after that? I think the way I see it is that the war kind of evolved into U.S. versus China. Yeah, I think that's pretty much the case, that uh, the, the North Korean command structure was pretty much entirely uh, destroyed uh, after the Incheon landing. Uh, a great many of the the uh, 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 officers in the uh, the uh, army of North Korea were killed or, or captured uh, after Pyongyang was taken. Kim Il Sung had to abandon the city. And there was even he was even considering becoming a, a guerrilla fighter up in the hills or something until the Chinese intervened. Yeah, the the, the, the after the, the spring of 19. Well, after the, uh, really the fall of 1950 when the Chinese intervened, it was more the Chinese against the uh, uh, United States and the North, South Koreans and UN Command. Yep. Anything? Yes? Yeah, two, two quick questions. Uh, I read a uh, Korean War book um, by the Korean War by an American uh, officer. He said that when they chose the 38th parallel to divide the two countries, they, they did, had no idea back in the U.S. Of the of even where it was, it was just sort of picked out of a hat. Number two, um, when the uh, the voluntary rep uh, repatriation occurred and the U.S. soldiers UN came back to South Korea, thirteen stayed, and he yeah. he inferred that uh, they were brainwashed as 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 like in the Manchurian Candidate the movie. Uh, could you comment on those yeah. two points? Okay. Well, well, the the thirty eight uh, parallel was not exactly drawn out of a hat. Actually, one of the American officers who made that decision or recommendation was uh, 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 Dean Rust, who later became Secretary of State. And they were concerned that once the Soviets entered the war against Japan, which the United States in the, in the spring of 1945 was very anxious to get Soviet involvement against, in the war against Japan, we were concerned it was going to take a, a half a million casualties to invade the Japanese home islands. We wanted the Soviets to come in and engage the Japanese, the huge forces they had uh, in Manchuria. So the idea was this would be a temporary dividing line, kind of temporarily divide Korea into North and South. The Soviets would accept the surrender of Japanese soldiers north of the 38th parallel. We would accept them south. The Soviets agreed to it. The 38th parallel was, the parallel was chosen. They looked at a map that seemed to be kind of in the middle of the country. Of course, it cut across all kinds of provincial lines and cities and towns railroad tracks and roads, even once we were in the middle of some houses if you defined it carefully enough. So it was never intended to be a permanent line. Uh, but uh, just like what happened in, in, uh, in Germany, the, where the, the spheres were set up uh, for occupation by the British, French, United States, and Soviet Union, they, they pretty much became permanent for more than a half a century, or about a half a century. The, the, um, the, the, yeah, the, the, at the peace negotiations, the issue of repatriation created a, a very embarrassing situation for the uh, North Koreans and the Chinese when it became clear that there were tens of thousands of soldiers held by the South and the UN command who did not want to return.
to North Korea or China. And so they tried to play up the propaganda game too. Uh, American prisoners of war were subject to these long lectures and asked to make you know, public confessions and all of this sort of thing. But yeah, it was only about a dozen U.S. soldiers who did not return uh, to the United States. So about a dozen as compared to tens of thousands. Uh, to what extent that, I mean, that there, there were these communist tactics that amounted to brainwashing, as a term that, that came in. They were subjected to these long harangues and, and deprived of food and, and in some cases tortured and so forth. And, and it, it may be that some of these prisoners who did not return had, had done things, ratted on fellow prisoners, and were afraid that there would be some kind of retribution against them if they returned to the United States. Um, but it, it, it was a, uh, the, the prisoner of war situation throughout the conflict was a, a very messy uh, uh, operation indeed. I, and, uh, yes, I care that young lady. peace treaty because neither side can agree on the, on the details. Uh, the, uh, uh, the best they could do in uh, Panmunjom after uh, two years of negotiation was an armistice, uh, so essentially a, a ceasefire. Uh, and even that was unacceptable to the South Korean regime. Uh, I, I've seen the, the copy of the uh, American copy of the Armistice Agreement, and it, it's signed by, uh, I forget the American commander who finally signed it, uh, Harrison was his name, and it's signed by Nam Il and uh, 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 I forget the, the Chinese commander. Uh, huh? Yeah, right. Okay, so at any rate, so it's so signed by these three. Three commanders. It's not really a head of state uh, kind of treaty. Uh, it's not. A, it means it's basically a, a military ceasefire, not an agreement among uh, heads of state. And uh, the South Koreans didn't even participate in the signing ceremonies. So technically, the the war is is still on. Um, uh, and we've been working on this now for close to close to 60 years. Um, and uh, I, I really don't know that we're any closer to a, uh, an all-out peace treaty now than the negotiations of Palmer John were in 1953. Uh, every time something seems to get close, there's uh, an attack or an incident that, that sets things back. Uh, I, do, I will say this, I think any agreement is going to have to come from the Koreans themselves. Uh, I don't think I think the situation in Korea is satisfactory to the Chinese, having a divided Korea with this kind of North Korean buffer zone. It's satisfactory to the United States to have the two Koreas. We would like to see a united Korea, but we're not going to, we're no more willing now than Harry Truman was in 1950 to have a nuclear war or World War III to achieve it. And I, it appears to me the Japanese are perfectly happy to see Korea divided into two. Maybe they prefer three or four Koreas, <laughs> five or six. <laughs> so um, uh, it's really going it, to, while there will always be some outside, and then the Soviet Union is no longer around, so it's not a factor anymore. But any, any kind of all out treaty, despite of the six powers and Americans and Chinese, you know, it, it's going to have to be the Koreans themselves. Uh, hey, we'd like to do this, and the rest of you just need to go along. Uh, that's my opinion. yes. Professor, I think uh, Truman was actually at Potsdam when the decision to effectively partition, I mean, you say this to accept the surrender of the Japanese forces at the 30th, by the side of the 30th power, effectively resulted in the partition of the country. Right. Did he, in respect, ever express any regret over having taken that decision? Because it's a it's a very crucial decision for the Korean people on both sides who regard it, you know, there's nothing to do with them. 
yeah. some of the big powers who divided them. And a somewhat related question, when the Soviet forces moved into Manchuria, they went a long way. They went, actually went into, into Chinese territory and uh, eventually withdrew because they were supposed to be friends with, with the Chinese. When they came into North Korea, uh, they did stop at the 38th parallel. And one sometimes wonders why. Why would they stop? Because there was nobody there to, to resist them. And they could have rolled all the way down to Busan. There were but virtually no American troops in the way. Right. Well, yeah, I, I think it's a question of uh, is the cup half empty or half full? I, mean, I, I think in Potsdam, when they said, oh, let's divide the 38th parallel, I, I think Trooper I thought, it's a pretty good deal. Because we, we don't have the forces, we don't have, we're not going to have the, the power to, to stop the Soviet Union anyway. They could have got the whole thing. And so I think Truman felt, coming out of Potsdam, that he uh, would be in a situation where he could keep the Soviet Union at bay. Now, he didn't, already he didn't want to have the kind of problems that, that the United States was already having with the Soviet Union over Eastern Europe and the division of Germany. You know, we, we don't need the Soviets to be, you know, uh, to have Japan divided up into spheres of influence. And, you know, we've even got this kind of buffer zone, the South Korea deal where we're going to divide it the 38th parallel. But it was, again, considered to be only uh, a temporary military demarcation line that would last a few months until order could be restored and there could be elections or basically they were talking first by the trustee ships. That became a political issue as well. So, yeah, and to some regards, I think Kramer probably felt when coming out of Potsdam, this isn't a bad deal for us. Uh, few Americans knew anything at all about Korea. Uh, you have to understand that Korea had been occupied by Japan for 35 years. If you look at a, at a globe or a map of the world that was printed by Rand McNally any time in the, in the 1920s or 30s, or even the early 40s during the Second World War, um, the, you know, Korea is shown in the same pink color as Japan. And, and so Americans really, most of them thought of, of Korea as a part of Japan. They had known nothing else other than a few missionaries and a few scholars who remembered the Korean independence and thousands of years of Korean history. Most Americans knew nothing about Korea. In fact, one of the big problems was when the United States military did come into Korea, Unlike the Soviets, we didn't have many Koreans <laughs> who could come in, who could uh, be uh, translators for the American service. And most of the language experts that the United States had spoke Japanese. And, and even people like uh, uh, Horace Underwood, uh, the late H.G. Uh, Underwood, who taught for many years at Yonsei. Um, his uh, first language was English, his second language was Japanese, because he was brought up. He was born in 1917 in, in South Korea under Japanese occupation. He knew Korean as well. And then during the Second World War, he became a language expert to interrogate Japanese prisoners. So his training was in Japanese. And this was just, we didn't have a large ethnic Korean minority like the Soviet Union had in its, uh, in its eastern regions. Well, I think I'm being about to be given the hook here one more. by Brother one Anthony. Oh, one more question. Okay. Of the whole negotiating process. Well, yeah, whether it was an act of courage or betrayal, it was a very, very gutsy move. Uh, the United States had become very frustrated by uh, uh, June and July of 1953 with uh, E. Sigmund. He was seen as a kind of a, a crusty old guy, very stubborn, uh, not uh, someone who understood political realities, someone who refused to see the larger picture of international relations was concerned only about the reunification of Korea, which the United States would have liked to seen happen, but again, wasn't willing to go to, to initiate World War III or run the risk of that to make it happen. So there were even, there was even some uh, uh, talk in the State <coughs> Department and military circles of maybe E. Sigmund is a little bit too old, maybe he needs to be replaced, maybe there should be some kind of regime change. So 
Uh, and I'm sure Sig e Sigma was aware of this, so in defiance, releasing these 20,000 or more prisoners into South Korean society, knowing that they really weren't a, a threat to South Korea, that they belonged in South Korea, but he released them because he wanted to disrupt the armistice talks, uh, have the North Koreans walk out, the Chinese walk out, and resume fight, and that was the way to, to keep the war going. So uh, I guess was it defiance, yeah, was it betrayal of the Americans? Well, I guess he felt the Americans had betrayed him uh, by not uh, unifying the country as, as he wanted it. Uh, but I, in terms of what his impact was on the, the peace negotiations, other than strong, uh, virulent protests by the Chinese and the North Koreans, it didn't slow the armistice process down at all. Uh, the, the, the Chinese, North Koreans, the Americans, now that, now that the Soviet Union had pretty much backed up, they had all had enough. And, and the release of the prisoners, from what I can tell, really didn't change the, the situation at Palm Beach at all. Okay, am I going to get the hook now? That's it. Okay, that's it. Thank you all very much.